Part Three of The Variable Man by Philip K. Dick. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Greg Marguerite. Part Three of The Variable Man by Philip K. Dick. Chapter Four. Three days later, Joseph Dixon slid a closed-circuit message plate across the desk to his boss. Here. You might be interested in this. Reinhardt picked the plate up slowly. What is it? You came all the way here to show me this? That's right. Why didn't you vid-screen it? Dixon smiled grimly. You'll understand when you decode it. It's from Proxima Centaurus. Centaurus? Our counterintelligence service. They sent it direct to me. Here, I'll decode it for you. Save you the trouble. Dixon came around behind Reinhardt's desk. He leaned over the commissioner's shoulder, taking hold of the plate and breaking the seal with his thumb. Hang on, Dixon said. This is going to hit you hard. According to our agents on Armin, the Centauran High Council has called an emergency session to deal with the problem of Terra's impending attack. Centauran relay carriers have reported to the High Council that the Terran bomb Icarus is virtually complete. Work on the bomb has been rushed through final stages in the underground laboratories under the Ural Range directed by Terran physicist Peter Sherikov. So I understand from Sherikov himself. Are you surprised the Centaurans know about the bomb? They have spies swarming over Terra. That's no news. There's more. Dixon traced the message plate grimly with an unsteady finger. The Centauran relay carriers report that Peter Sherikov brought an expert mechanic out of a previous time continuum to complete the wiring of the turret. Reinhardt staggered, holding on tight to the desk. He closed his eyes, gasping. The variable man is still alive, Dixon murmured. I don't know how or why. There's nothing left of the Albertines, and how the hell did the man get halfway around the world? Reinhardt opened his eyes slowly, his face twisting. Sherikov. He must have removed him before the attack. I told Sherikov the attack was forthcoming. I gave him the exact hour. He had to get help. From the variable man. He couldn't meet his promise otherwise. Reinhardt leaped up and began to pace back and forth. I've already informed the SRB machines that the variable man has been destroyed. The machines now show the original 7-6 ratio in our favor, but the ratio is based on false information. Then. You'll have to withdraw the false data and restore the original situation. No. Reinhardt shook his head. I can't do that. The machines must be kept functioning. We can't allow them to jam again. It's too dangerous. If Duff should become aware that... What are you going to do, then? Dixon picked up the message plate. You can't leave the machines with false data. That's treason. The data can't be withdrawn. Not unless equivalent data exists to take its place. Reinhardt paced angrily back and forth. Damn it! I was certain the man was dead. This is an incredible situation. He, he must be eliminated at any cost. Suddenly Reinhardt stopped pacing. The turret. It's probably finished by this time, correct? Dixon nodded slowly in agreement. With the variable man helping, Sherikov has undoubtedly completed the work well ahead of schedule. Reinhardt's gray eyes flickered. Then he's no longer of any use, even to Sherikov. We could take a chance, even if there were active opposition. What's this? Dixon demanded. What are you thinking about? How many units are ready for immediate action? How large a force can we raise without notice? Because of the war, we're mobilized on a 24-hour basis. There are 70 air units and about 200 surface units. The balance of the security forces have been transferred to the line under military control. Men? We have about 5,000 men ready to go, still on Terra, most of them in the process of being transferred to military transports. I can hold it up at any time. Missiles? Fortunately, the launching tubes have not yet been disassembled. They're still here on Terra. In another few days, they'll be moving out for the colonial fracas. Then they're available for immediate use. Yes. Good. 
Reinhardt locked his hands, nodding his fingers harshly together in sudden decision. That will do exactly. Unless I am completely wrong, Sherikov has only a half-dozen air units and no surface cars, and only about two hundred men. Some defense shields, of course. What are you planning? Reinhardt's face was gray and hard like stone. Send out orders for all available security units to be unified under your immediate command. Have them ready to move by four o'clock this afternoon. We're going to pay a visit, Reinhardt stated grimly. A surprise visit on Peter Sherikov. Stop here, Reinhardt ordered. The surface car slowed to a halt. Reinhardt peered cautiously out, studying the horizon ahead. On all sides a desert of scrub grass and sand stretched out. Nothing moved or stirred. To the right the grass and sand rose up to form immense peaks, a range of mountains without end, disappearing finally into the distance. The Urals. Over there, Reinhardt said to Dixon, pointing. See? No. Look hard. It's difficult to spot unless you know what to look for. Vertical pipes, some kind of vent, or periscopes. Dixon saw them finally. I would have driven past without noticing. It's well concealed. The main labs are a mile down. Under the range itself, it's virtually impregnable. Sharikov had it built years ago to withstand any attack from the air by surface cars, bombs, missiles. He must feel safe down there. No doubt. Reinhardt gazed up at the sky. A few faint black dots could be seen moving lazily about in broad circles. Those aren't ours, are they? I gave orders. No, they're not ours. All our units are out of sight. Those belong to Sherikov, his patrol. Reinhardt relaxed. Good. He reached over and flicked on the vid screen over the board of the car. This screen is shielded. It can't be traced. There's no way they can spot it back to us. It's non-directional. The screen glowed into life. Reinhardt punched the combination keys and sat back to wait. After a time, an image formed on the screen. A heavy face, bushy black beard, and large eyes. Peter Sherikov gazed at Reinhardt with surprised curiosity. Commissioner, where are you calling from? What? How's the work progressing? Reinhardt broke in coldly. Is Icarus almost complete? Sherikov beamed with expansive pride. He's done, Commissioner. Two days ahead of time. Icarus is ready to be launched into space. I tried to call your office, but they told me— I'm not at my office. Reinhardt leaned toward the screen. Open your entrance tunnel at the surface. You're about to receive visitors. Sherikov blinked. Visitors? I'm coming down to see you. About Icarus. Have the tunnel open for me at once. Exactly where are you, Commissioner? On the surface. Sherikov's eyes flickered. Oh, but— Open up, Reinhardt snapped. He glanced at his wristwatch. I'll be at the entrance in five minutes. I expect to find it ready for me. Of course, Sherikov nodded in bewilderment. I'm always glad to see you, Commissioner, but I— Five minutes, then. Reinhardt cut the circuit. The screen died. He turned quickly to Dixon. You stay up here as we arranged. I'll go down with one company of police. You understand the necessity of exact timing on this. We won't slip up. Everything's ready. All units are in their places. Good. Reinhardt pushed the door open for him. You join your directional staff. I'll proceed toward the tunnel entrance. Good luck. Dixon leaped out of the car onto the sandy ground. A gust of dry air swirled into the car around Reinhardt. I'll see you later. Reinhardt slammed the door. He turned to the group of police crouched in the rear of the car, their guns held tightly. Here we go, Reinhardt murmured. Hold on. The car raced across the sandy ground toward the tunnel entrance to Sherikov's underground fortress. Sherikov met Reinhardt at the bottom end of the tunnel, where the tunnel opened up onto the main floor of the lab. The big Pole approached, his hand out, beaming with pride and satisfaction. It's a pleasure to see you, Commissioner. This is an historic moment. Reinhardt got out of the car with his group of armed security police. Calls for a celebration, doesn't it? he said. That's a good idea. We're two days ahead, Commissioner. The SRB machines will be interested. The odds should change abruptly at the news. Let's go down to the lab, 
I want to see the control turret myself. A shadow crossed Sherikov's face. I'd rather not bother the workmen right now, Commissioner. They've been under a great load, trying to complete the turret in time. I believe they're putting a few last finishes on it at the moment. We can view them by vidscreen. I'm curious to see them at work. It must be difficult to wire such minute relays. Sherikov shook his head. Sorry, Commissioner. No vidscreen on them. I won't allow it. This is too important. Our whole future depends on it. Reinhardt snapped a signal to his company of police. Put this man under arrest. Sherikov blanched. His mouth fell open. The police moved quickly around him, their gun tubes up, jabbing into him. He was searched rapidly, efficiently. His gun belt and concealed energy screen were yanked off. What's going on? Sherikov demanded, some color returning to his face. What are you doing? You're under arrest for the duration of the war. You're relieved of all authority. From now on, one of my men will operate designs. When the war is over, you'll be tried before the Council and President Duff. Sherikov shook his head, dazed. I don't understand. What's this all about? Explain it to me, Commissioner. What's happened? Reinhardt signaled to his police. Get ready. We're going into the lab. We may have to shoot our way in. The variable man should be in the area of the bomb, working on the control turret. Instantly, Sherikov's face hardened. His black eyes glittered, alert and hostile. Reinhardt laughed harshly. We received a counterintelligence report from Centaurus. I'm surprised at you, Sherikov. You know the Centaurans are everywhere with their relay carriers. You should have known. Sherikov moved. Fast. All at once he broke away from the police, throwing his massive body against them. They fell, scattering. Sherikov ran directly at the wall. The police fired wildly. Reinhardt fumbled frantically for his gun tube, pulling it up. Sherikov reached the wall, running head down, energy beams flashing around him. He struck against the wall and vanished. Down! Reinhardt shouted. He dropped to his hands and knees. All around him his police dived for the floor. Reinhardt cursed wildly, dragging himself quickly toward the door. They had to get out, and right away. Sherikov had escaped. A false wall, an energy barrier set to respond to his pressure. He had dashed through it to safety. He— From all sides an inferno burst. A flaming roar of death surging over them, around them, on every side. The room was alive with blazing masses of destruction bouncing from wall to wall. They were caught between four banks of power, all of them open to full discharge, a trap, a death trap. Reinhardt reached the hall, gasping for breath. He leaped to his feet. A few security police followed him. Behind them, in the flaming room, the rest of the company screamed and struggled, blasted out of existence by the leaping bursts of power. Reinhardt assembled his remaining men. Already Sherikov's guards were forming. At one end of the corridor a snub-barreled robot gun was maneuvering into position. A siren wailed. Guards were running on all sides, hurrying to battle stations. The robot gun opened fire. Part of the corridor exploded, bursting into fragments. Clouds of choking debris and particles swept around them. Reinhardt and his police retreated, moving back along the corridor. They reached a junction. A second robot gun was rumbling toward them, hurrying to get within range. Reinhardt fired carefully, aiming at its delicate control. Abruptly the gun spun convulsively. It lashed against the wall, smashing itself into the unyielding metal. Then it collapsed in a heap, gears still whining and spinning. Come on! Reinhardt moved away, crouching and running. He glanced at his watch. Almost time. A few more minutes. A group of lab guards appeared ahead of them. Reinhardt fired. Behind him his police fired past him. Violet shafts of energy catching the group of guards as they entered the corridor. The guards spilled apart, falling and twisting. Part of them settled into dust, drifting down the corridor. Reinhardt made his way toward the lab, crouching and leaping, pushing past heaps of debris and remains, followed by his men. Come on! Don't stop! Suddenly from around them the booming, enlarged voice of Sherikov thundered, magnified by rows of wall speakers along the corridor. Reinhardt halted, glancing around. Reinhardt, you haven't got a chance. You'll never get back to the surface. Throw down your guns and give up. You're surrounded on all sides. You're a mile under the surface. 
Reinhardt threw himself into motion, pushing into billowing clouds of particles drifting along the corridor. Are you sure, Sherikov? He grunted. Sherikov laughed, his harsh metallic peals rolling in waves against Reinhardt's eardrums. I don't want to have to kill you, Commissioner. You're vital to the war. I'm sorry you found out about the Variable Man. I admit we overlooked the Centauran espionage as a factor in this, but now that you know about him... Suddenly Sherikov's voice broke off. A deep rumble had shaken the floor, a lapping vibration that shuddered through the corridor. Reinhardt sagged with relief. He peered through the clouds of debris, making out the figures on his watch. Right on time, not a second late. The first of the hydrogen missiles launched from the Council buildings on the other side of the world were beginning to arrive. The attack had begun. At exactly six o'clock, Joseph Dixon, standing on the surface four miles from the entrance tunnel, gave the sign to the waiting units. The first job was to break down Sherikov's defense screens. The missiles had to penetrate without interference. At Dixon's signal, a fleet of thirty security ships dived from a height of ten miles, swooping above the mountains, directly over the underground laboratories. Within five minutes the defense screens had been smashed, and all the tower projectors leveled flat. Now the mountains were virtually unprotected. So far so good, Dixon murmured as he watched from his secure position. The fleet of security ships roared back, their work done. Across the face of the desert, the police surface cars were crawling rapidly toward the entrance tunnel, snaking from side to side. Meanwhile, Sherikov's counterattack had begun to go into operation. Guns mounted among the hills opened fire. Vast columns of flame burst up in the path of the advancing cars. The cars hesitated and retreated as the plane was churned up by a howling vortex, a thundering chaos of explosions. Here and there a car vanished in a cloud of particles. A group of cars moving away suddenly scattered, caught up by a giant wind that lashed across them and swept them up into the air. Dixon gave orders to have the cannon silenced. The police air arm again swept overhead, a sullen roar of jets that shook the ground below. The police ships dived expertly and hurtled down on the cannon protecting the hills. The cannon forgot the surface cars and lifted their snouts to meet the attack. Again and again the airships came, rocking the mountains with titanic blasts. The guns became silent. Their echoing boom diminished, died away reluctantly, as bombs took critical toll of them. Dixon watched with satisfaction as the bombing came to an end. The airships rose in a thick swarm, black gnats shooting up in triumph from a dead carcass. They hurried back as emergency anti-aircraft robot guns swung into position and saturated the sky with blazing puffs of energy. Dixon checked his wristwatch. The missiles were already on the way from North America. Only a few minutes remained. The surface cars, freed by the successful bombing, began to regroup for a new frontal attack. Again they crawled forward across the burning plain, bearing down cautiously on the battered wall of mountains heading toward the twisted wrecks that had been the ring of defense guns, toward the entrance tunnel. An occasional cannon fired feebly at them. The cars came grimly on. Now, in the hollows of the hills, Sherikov's troops were hurrying to the surface to meet the attack. The first car reached the shadow of the mountains. A deafening hail of fire burst loose. Small robot guns appeared everywhere, needle barrels emerging from behind hidden screens, trees and shrubs, rocks, stones. The police cars were caught in a withering crossfire, trapped at the base of the hills. Down the slope, Sherikov's guards raced toward the stalled cars. Clouds of heat rose up and boiled across the plain as the cars fired up at the running men. A robot gun dropped like a slug onto the plain and screamed towards the cars firing as it came. Dixon twisted nervously. Only a few minutes. Any time now. He shaded his eyes and peered up at the sky. No sign of them yet. He wondered about Reinhardt. No signal had come up from below. Clearly Reinhardt had run into trouble. No doubt there was desperate fighting going on in the maze of underground tunnels, the intricate web of passages that honeycombed the earth below the mountains. In the air, Sherikov's few defense ships were taking on the police raiders. Outnumbered, the defense ships darted rapidly, wildly, putting up a futile fight. 
Sherikov's guards streamed out onto the plain. Crouching and running, they advanced toward the stalled cars. The police airships screeched down at them, guns thundering. Dixon held his breath. When the missiles arrived. The first missile struck. A section of the mountain vanished, turned to smoke and foaming gases. The wave of heat slapped Dixon across the face, spinning him around. Quickly he re-entered his ship and took off, shooting rapidly away from the scene. He glanced back. A second and third missile had arrived. Great gaping pits yawned among the mountains, vast sections missing like broken teeth. Now the missiles could penetrate to the underground laboratories below. On the ground the surface cars halted beyond the danger area, waiting for the missile attack to finish. When the eighth missile had struck, the cars again moved forward. No more missiles fell. Dixon swung his ship around, heading back toward the scene. The laboratory was exposed. The top sections of it had been ripped open. The laboratory lay like a tin can torn apart by mighty explosions, its first floors visible from the air. Men and cars were pouring down into it, fighting with the guards swarming to the surface. Dixon watched intently. Sherikov's men were bringing up heavy guns, big robot artillery. But the police ships were diving again. Sherikov's defensive patrols had been cleared from the sky. The police ships whined down, arcing over the exposed laboratory. Small bombs fell, whistling down, pinpointing the artillery rising to the surface on the remaining lift stages. Abruptly Dixon's vidscreen clicked. Dixon turned toward it. Reinhardt's features formed. Call off the attack! His uniform was torn. A deep, bloody gash crossed his cheek. He grinned sourly at Dixon, pushing his tangled hair back out of his face. Quite a fight. Sherikov? He's called off his guards. We've agreed to a truce. It's all over. No more needed. Reinhardt gasped for breath, wiping some grime and sweat from his neck. Land your ship and come down here at once. The variable man? That comes next, Reinhardt said grimly. He adjusted his gun tube. I want you down here for that part. I want you to be in on the kill. Reinhardt turned away from the vid screen. In the corner of the room, Sherikov stood silently, saying, frothing, Well? Reinhardt barked. Where is he? Where will I find him? Sherikov licked his lips nervously, glancing up at Reinhardt. Commissioner, are, are you sure? The attack has been called off. Your labs are safe. So is your life. Now it's your turn to come through. Reinhardt gripped his gun, moving toward Sherikov. Where is he? For a moment Sherikov hesitated, then slowly his huge body sagged, defeated. He shook his head wearily. All right, I'll show you where he is. His voice was hardly audible, a dry whisper. Down this way, come on. Reinhardt followed Sherikov out of the room into the corridor. Police and guards were working rapidly, clearing the debris and ruins away, putting out the hydrogen fires that burned everywhere. No tricks, Sherikov. No tricks, Sherikov nodded resignedly. Thomas Cole is by himself in a wing lab off the main rooms. Cole? The variable man. That's his name. The Pole turned his massive head a little. He has a name. Reinhardt waved his gun. Hurry up. I don't want anything to go wrong. This is the part I came for. You must remember something, Commissioner. What is it? Sherikov stopped walking. Commissioner, nothing must happen to the globe, the control turret. Everything depends on it. The war, our whole— I know. Nothing will happen to the damn thing. Let's go. If it should get damaged— I'm not after the globe. I'm interested only in— in— Thomas Cole. They came to the end of the corridor and stopped before a metal door. Sherikov nodded at the door. In there. Reinhardt moved back. Open the door. Open it yourself. I don't want to have anything to do with it. Reinhardt shrugged. He stepped up to the door. Holding his gun level, he raised his hand, passing it in front of the eye circuit. Nothing happened. Reinhardt frowned. He pushed the door with his hand. The door slid open. Reinhardt was looking into a small laboratory. He glimpsed a workbench, tools, heaps of equipment, measuring devices, and in the center of the bench, the transparent globe, 
the control turret. Cole? Reinhardt advanced quickly into the room. He glanced around him, suddenly alarmed. Where? The room was empty. Thomas Cole was gone. When the first missile struck, Cole stopped work and sat listening. Far off, a distant rumble rolled through the earth, shaking the floor under him. On the bench, tools and equipment danced up and down. A pair of pliers fell crashing to the floor. A box of screws tipped over, spilling its minute contents out. Cole listened for a time. Presently he lifted the transparent globe from the bench. With careful, controlled hands he held the globe up, running his fingers gently over the surface, his faded blue eyes thoughtful. Then, after a time, he placed the globe back on the bench in its mount. The globe was finished. A faint glow of pride moved through the variable man. The globe was the finest job he had ever done. The deep rumbling ceased. Cole became instantly alert. He jumped down from his stool, hurrying across the room to the door. For a moment he stood by the door, listening intently. He could hear noise on the other side, shouts, guards running past, dragging heavy equipment, working frantically. A rolling crash echoed down the corridor and lapped against his door. The concussion spun him around. Again a tide of energy shook the walls and floor and sent him down on his knees. The lights flickered and winked out. Cole fumbled in the dark until he found a flashlight. Power failure. He could hear crackling flames. Abruptly the lights came on again, an ugly yellow, then faded back out. Cole bent down and examined the door with his flashlight. A magnetic lock, dependent on an externally induced electric flux. He grabbed a screwdriver and pried at the door. For a moment it held, then it fell open. Cole stepped warily out into the corridor. Everything was in shambles. Guards wandered everywhere, burned and half-blinded. Two lay groaning under a pile of wrecked equipment. Fused guns, reeking metal. The air was heavy with the smell of burning wiring and plastic. A thick cloud that choked him and made him bend double as he advanced. Halt! A guard gasped feebly, struggling to rise. Cole pushed past him and down the corridor. Two small robot guns, still functioning, glided past him hurriedly toward the drumming chaos of battle. He followed. At a major intersection, the fight was in full swing. Sherikov's guards fought. Security police crouched behind pillars and barricades, firing wildly, desperately. Again, the whole structure shuddered as a great booming blast ignited someplace above. Bombs? Shells? Cole threw himself down as a violent beam cut past his ear and disintegrated the wall behind him. A security policeman, wild-eyed, firing erratically. One of Sherikov's guards winged him and his gun skidded to the floor. A robot cannon turned toward him as he made his way past the intersection. He began to run. The cannon rolled along behind him, aiming itself uncertainly. Cole hunched over as he shambled rapidly along, gasping for breath. In the flickering yellow light he saw a handful of security police advancing, firing expertly, intent on a line of defense Sherikov's guards had hastily set up. The robot cannon altered its course to take them on, and Cole escaped around the corner. He was in the main lab, the big chamber where Icarus himself rose, the vast squat column. Icarus. A solid wall of guards surrounded him, grim-faced, hugging guns and protection shields. But the security police were leaving Icarus alone. Nobody wanted to damage him. Cole evaded a lone guard, tracking him, and reached the far side of the lab. It took him only a few seconds to find the force field generator. There was no switch. For a moment that puzzled him, and then he remembered. The guard had controlled it from his wrist. Too late to worry about that. With his screwdriver he unfastened the plate over the generator and ripped out the wiring in handfuls. The generator came loose, and he dragged it away from the wall. The screen was off, thank God. He managed to carry the generator into a side corridor. Crouched in a heap, Cole bent over the generator, deft fingers flying. He pulled the wiring to him and laid it out on the floor, tracing the circuits with feverish haste. The adaptation was easier than he had expected. The screen floated right angles to the wiring for a distance of six feet. 
Each lead was shielded on one side, the field radiated outward, leaving a hollow cone in the center. He ran the wiring through his belt, down his trouser legs, under his shirt, all the way to his wrists and ankles. He was just snatching up the heavy generator when two security police appeared. They raised their blasters and fired point-blank. Cole clicked on the screen. A vibration leaped through him that snapped his jaw and danced up his body. He staggered away, half stupefied by the surging force that radiated out from him. The violet rays struck the field and deflected harmlessly. He was safe. He hurried on down the corridor, past a ruined gun and sprawled bodies still clutching blasters. Great drifting clouds of radioactive particles billowed around him. He edged by one cloud nervously. Guards lay everywhere, dying and dead, partly destroyed, eaten and corroded by the hot metallic salts in the air. He had to get out, and fast. At the end of the corridor a whole section of the fortress was in ruins. Towering flames leaped on all sides. One of the missiles had penetrated below ground level. Cole found a lift that still functioned. A load of wounded guards was being raised to the surface. None of them paid any attention to him. Flames surged around the lift, licking at the wounded. Workmen were desperately trying to get the lift into action. Cole leaped onto the lift. A moment later it began to rise, leaving the shouts and flames behind. The lift emerged on the surface and Cole jumped off. A guard spotted him and gave chase. Crouching, Cole dodged into a tangled mass of twisted metal, still white-hot and smoking. He ran for a distance, leaping from the side of the ruined defense screen tower onto the fused ground and down the side of the hill. The ground was hot underfoot. He hurried as fast as he could, gasping for breath. He came to a long slope and scrambled up the side. The guard who had followed was gone, lost behind in the rolling clouds of ash that drifted from the ruins of Sherikov's underground fortress. Cole reached the top of the hill. For a brief moment he halted to get his breath and figure where he was. It was almost evening. The sun was beginning to set. In the darkening sky a few dots still twisted and rolled, black specks that abruptly burst into flame and fused out again. Cole stood up cautiously, peering around him. Ruins stretched out below, on all sides, the furnace from which he had escaped. A chaos of incandescent metal and debris gutted and wrecked beyond repair. Miles of tangled rubbish and half-vaporized equipment. He considered. Everyone was busy putting out the fires and pulling the wounded to safety. It would be a while before he was missed, but as soon as they realized he was gone they'd be after him. Most of the laboratory had been destroyed. Nothing lay back that way. Beyond the ruins lay the great Ural peaks, the endless mountains stretching out as far as the eye could see. Mountains and green forests, a wilderness. They'd never find him there. Cole started along the side of the hill, walking slowly and carefully, his screen generator under his arm. Probably in the confusion he could find enough food and equipment to last him indefinitely. He could wait until early morning, then circle back toward the ruins and load up. With a few tools and his own innate skill he would get along fine. A screwdriver, hammer, nails, odds and ends. A great hum sounded in his ears. It swelled to a deafening roar. Startled coal whirled around. A vast shape filled the sky behind him, growing each moment. Cole stood frozen, utterly transfixed. The shape thundered over him above his head as he stood stupidly rooted to the spot. Then, awkwardly, uncertainly, he began to run. He stumbled and fell and rolled a short distance down the side of the hill. Desperately he struggled to hold on to the ground. His hands dug wildly, futilely, into the soft soil, trying to keep the generator under his arm at the same time. A flash and a blinding spark of light around him. The spark picked him up and tossed him like a dry leaf. He grunted in agony as searing fire crackled about him, a blazing inferno that gnawed and ate hungrily through his screen. He spun dizzily and fell through the cloud of fire down into a pit of darkness, a vast gulf between two hills. His wiring ripped off, the generator tore out of his grip and was lost behind. Abruptly his force field ceased. 
Cole lay in the darkness at the bottom of the hill. His whole body shrieked in agony as the unholy fire played over him. He was a blazing cinder, a half-consumed ash flaming in a universe of darkness. The pain made him twist and crawl like an insect, trying to burrow into the ground. He screamed and shrieked and struggled to escape, to get away from the hideous fire, to reach the curtain of darkness beyond where it was cool and silent, where the flames couldn't crackle and eat at him. He reached imploringly out, into the darkness, groping feebly toward it, trying to pull himself into it. Gradually the glowing orb that was his own body faded. The impenetrable chaos of night descended. He allowed the tide to sweep over him, to extinguish the searing fire. Dixon landed his ship expertly, bringing it to a halt in front of an overturned defense tower. He leaped out and hurried across the smoking ground. From a lift, Reinhardt appeared, surrounded by his security police. He got away from us! He escaped! He didn't escape, Dixon answered. I got him myself. Reinhardt quivered violently. What do you mean? Come along with me, over in this direction. He and Reinhardt climbed the side of a demolished hill, both of them panting for breath. I was landing. I saw a figure emerge from a lift and run toward the mountains, like some sort of animal. When he came out in the open, I dived on him and released a phosphorus bomb. Then, then he's dead? I don't see how anyone could have lived through a phosphorus bomb. They reached the top of the hill. Dixon halted, then pointed excitedly down into the pit beyond the hill. There! They descended cautiously. The ground was singed and burned clean. Clouds of smoke hung heavily in the air. Occasional fires still flickered here and there. Reinhardt coughed and bent over to see. Dixon flashed on a pocket flare and set it beside the body. The body was charred, half destroyed by the burning phosphorus. It lay motionless, one arm over its face, mouth open, legs sprawled grotesquely, like some abandoned rag doll tossed in an incinerator and consumed almost beyond recognition. He's alive, Dixon muttered. He felt around curiously. Must have had some kind of protection screen. Amazing that a man could— It's, it's him? It's really him? Fits the description. Dixon tore away a handful of burned clothing. This is the variable man. What's left of him, at least. Reinhardt sagged with relief. Then we've finally got him. The data is accurate. He's no longer a factor. Dixon got out his blaster and released the safety catch thoughtfully. If you want, I could finish the job right now. At that moment, Sherikov appeared, accompanied by two armed security police. He strode grimly down the hillside, black eyes snapping. Did Cole? He broke off. Good God! Dixon got him with a phosphorus bomb, Reinhardt said noncommittally. He had reached the surface and was trying to get into the mountains. Sherikov turned wearily away. He was an amazing person. During the attack he managed to force the lock on his door and escape. The guards fired at him, but nothing happened. He had rigged up some kind of force field around him, something he adapted. Anyhow, it's over with, Reinhardt answered. Did you have SRB plates made up on him? Sherikov reached slowly into his coat. He drew out a manila envelope. Here's all the information I collected on him while he was with me. Is it complete? Everything previously has been merely fragmentary. As near complete as I could make it, it includes photographs and diagrams of the interior of the globe. The turret wiring he did for me. I haven't had a chance even to look at them." Sherikov fingered the envelope. What are you going to do with Cole? Have him loaded up, taken back to the city, and officially put to sleep by the euthanasia ministry. Legal murder? Sherikov's lips twisted. Why don't you simply do it right here and get it over with? Reinhardt grabbed the envelope and stuck it in his pocket. I'll turn this right over to the machines. He motioned to Dixon. Let's go. Now we can notify the fleet to prepare for the attack on Centaurus. He turned briefly back to Sherikov. When can Icarus be launched? In an hour or so, I suppose. They're locking the control turret in place. Assuming it functions correctly, that's all it's needed. Good. 
I'll notify Duff to send out the signal to the war fleet. Reinhardt nodded to the police to take Sherikov to the waiting security ship. Sherikov moved off dully, his face gray and haggard. Cole's inert body was picked up and tossed onto a freight cart. The cart rumbled into the hold of the security ship, and the lock slid shut after it. It'll be interesting to see how the machines respond to the additional data, Dixon said. It should make quite an improvement in the odds, Reinhardt agreed. He patted the envelope, bulging in his inside pocket. We're two days ahead of time. Margaret Duff got up slowly from her desk. She pushed her chair automatically back. Let me get all this straight. You mean the bomb is finished, ready to go? Reinhardt nodded impatiently. That's what I said. The technicians are checking the turret locks to make sure it's properly attached. The launching will take place in half an hour. Thirty minutes? Then— Then the attack can begin at once. I assume the fleet is ready for action. Of course it's been ready for several days, but I can't believe the bomb is ready so soon. Margaret Duff moved numbly toward the door of her office. This is a great day, Commissioner, and old era lies behind us. This time tomorrow Centaurus will be gone, and eventually the colonies will be ours. It's been a long climb, Reinhardt murmured. One thing. Your charge against Sherikov. It seems incredible that a person of his caliber could ever— We'll discuss that later, Reinhardt interrupted coldly. He pulled the manila envelope from his coat. I haven't had the opportunity to feed the additional data to the SRB machines. If you'll excuse me, I'll do that now. For a moment Margaret Duff stood at the door. The two of them faced each other silently, neither speaking, a faint smile on Reinhardt's thin lips, hostility in the woman's blue eyes. Reinhardt? Sometimes I think perhaps you'll go too far, and sometimes I think you've already gone too far. I'll inform you of any change in the odds showing. Reinhardt strode past her, out of the office and down the hall. He headed toward the SRB room, an intense thalmic excitement rising up inside him. A few moments later he entered the SRB room. He made his way to the machines. The odds, seven-six, showed in the view windows. Reinhardt smiled a little. Seven-six. False odds. Based on incorrect information. Now they could be removed. Kaplan hurried over. Reinhardt handed him the envelope and moved over to the window, gazing down at the scene below. Men and cars scurried frantically everywhere. Officials coming and going like ants, hurrying in all directions. The war was on. The signal had been sent out to the war fleet that had waited so long near Proxima Centaurus. A feeling of triumph raced through Reinhardt. He had won. He had destroyed the man from the past and broken Peter Sherikov. The war had begun as planned. Terra was breaking out. Reinhardt smiled thinly. He had been completely successful. Commissioner? Reinhardt turned slowly. All right. Kaplan was standing in front of the machines, gazing down at the reading. Commissioner? Sudden alarm plucked at Reinhardt. There was something in Kaplan's voice. He hurried quickly over. What is it? Kaplan looked up at him, his face white, his eyes wide with terror. His mouth opened and closed, but no sound came. What is it? Reinhardt demanded, chilled. He bent toward the machines, studying the reading, and sickened with horror. One hundred to one against Terra. He could not tear his gaze away from the figures. He was numb, shocked with disbelief. A hundred to one? What had happened? What, what had gone wrong? The turret was finished. Icarus was ready. The fleet had been notified. There was a sudden deep buzz from outside the building. Shouts drifted up from below. Reinhardt turned his head slowly toward the window, his heart frozen with fear. Across the evening sky a trail moved, rising each moment, a thin line of white. Something climbed, gaining speed each moment. On the ground all eyes were turned toward it, awed faces peering up. The object gained speed, faster and faster. Then it vanished. Icarus was on his way. The attack had begun. It was too late to stop now. And on the machines the odds read a hundred to one for failure.
At eight o'clock in the evening of May 15, 2136, Icarus was launched toward the star Centaurus. A day later, while all Terra waited, Icarus entered the star, traveling at thousands of times the speed of light. Nothing happened. Icarus disappeared into the star. There was no explosion. The bomb failed to go off. At the same time, the Terran war fleet engaged the Centauran outer fleet, sweeping down in a concentrated attack. Twenty major ships were seized. A good part of the Centauran fleet was destroyed. Many of the captive systems began to revolt, in the hope of throwing off the Imperial bonds. Two hours later, the massed Centauran war fleet from Armin abruptly appeared and joined battle. The great struggle illuminated half the Centauran system. Ship after ship flashed briefly and then faded to ash. For a whole day the two fleets fought, strung out over millions of miles of space. Innumerable fighting men died, on both sides. At last the remains of the battered Terran fleet turned and limped towards Armin, defeated. Little of the once impressive armada remained, a few blackened hulls making their way uncertainly toward captivity. Icarus had not functioned. Centaurus had not exploded. The attack was a failure. The war was over. We've lost the war, Margaret Duff said in a small voice, wondering and awed. It's over. Finished. The council members sat in their places around the conference table, gray-haired elderly men, none of them speaking or moving. All gazed up mutely at the great stellar maps that covered two walls of the chamber. I have already empowered negotiators to arrange a truce, Margaret Duff murmured. Orders have been sent out to Vice Commander Jessup to give up the battle. There's no hope. Fleet Commander Carlton destroyed himself and his flagship a few minutes ago. The Centauran High Council has agreed to end the fighting. Their whole empire is rotten to the core, ready to topple of its own weight. Reinhardt was slumped over at the table, his head in his hands. I, I don't understand. Why? Why didn't the bomb explode? He mopped his forehead shakily. All his poise was gone. He was trembling and broken. What went wrong? Gray-faced Dixon mumbled an answer. The variable man must have sabotaged the turret. The SRB machines knew. They analyzed the data. They knew. But it was too late. Reinhardt's eyes were bleak with despair as he raised his head a little. I knew he'd destroy us. We're finished. A century of work and planning. His body nodded in a spasm of furious agony. All because of Sherikov. Margaret Duff eyed Reinhardt coldly. Why because of Sherikov? He kept Cole alive. I wanted him killed from the start. Suddenly Reinhardt jumped from his chair. His hand clutched convulsively at his gun. And he's still alive. Even if we've lost, I'm going to have the pleasure of putting a blast beam through Cole's chest. Sit down, Margaret Duff ordered. Reinhardt was halfway to the door. He's still at the euthanasia ministry, waiting for the official— No, he's not, Margaret Duff said. Reinhardt froze. He turned slowly, as if unable to believe his senses. What? Cole isn't at the ministry. I ordered him transferred, and your instructions canceled. Where, where is he? There was unusual hardness in Margaret Duff's voice as she answered. With Peter Sherikov, in the Urals. I had Sherikov's full authority restored. I then had Cole transferred there, put in Sherikov's safekeeping. I want to make sure Cole recovers so we can keep our promise to him, our promise to return him to his own time. Reinhardt's mouth opened and closed. All the color had drained from his face. His cheek muscles twitched spasmodically. At last he managed to speak. You've gone insane. The traitor responsible for Earth's greatest defeat. We have lost the war, Margaret Duff stated quietly. But this is not a day of defeat. It is a day of victory, the most incredible victory Terra has ever had. Reinhardt and Dixon were dumbfounded. What? Reinhardt gasped. What? What do you? The whole room was in an uproar. All the council members were on their feet. Reinhardt's words were drowned out. Sherikov will explain when he gets here. Margaret Duff's calm voice came. He's the one who discovered it. She looked around the chamber at the incredulous council members. 
everyone stays in his seat. You are all to remain here until Sherikov arrives. It's vital you hear what he has to say. His news transforms this whole situation." Peter Sherikov accepted the briefcase of papers from his armed technician. Thanks. He pushed his chair back and glanced thoughtfully around the council chamber. Is everybody ready to hear what I have to say? We're ready, Margaret Duff answered. The council members sat alertly around the table. At the far end, Reinhardt and Dixon watched uneasily as the big Pole removed papers from his briefcase and carefully examined them. To begin, I recall to you the original work behind the FTL bomb. Jameson Hedge was the first human to propel an object at a speed greater than light. As you know, that object diminished in length and gained in mass as it moved toward the light speed. When it reached that speed, it vanished. It ceased to exist in our terms. Having no length, it could not occupy space. It rose to a different order of existence. When Hedge tried to bring the object back, an explosion occurred. Hedge was killed and all his equipment was destroyed. The force of the blast was beyond calculation. Hedge had placed his observation ship many millions of miles away. It was not far enough, however. Originally he had hoped his drive might be used for space travel, but after his death the principle was abandoned. That is, until Icarus. I saw the possibilities of a bomb, an incredibly powerful bomb, to destroy Centaurus and all the Empire's forces. The reappearance of Icarus would mean the annihilation of their system. As Hedge had shown, the object would re-enter space already occupied by matter, and the cataclysm would be beyond belief. But Icarus never came back, Reinhardt cried. Cole altered the wiring so the bomb kept on going. It's probably still going. Wrong, Sherikov boomed. The bomb did reappear, but it didn't explode. Reinhardt reacted violently. You mean? The bomb came back dropping below the FTL speed as soon as it entered the star Proxima, but it did not explode. There was no cataclysm. It reappeared and was absorbed by the sun, turned into gas at once. Why didn't it explode? Dixon demanded. Because Thomas Cole solved Hedge's problem. He found a way to bring the FTL object back into this universe without collision, without an explosion. The variable man found what Hedge was after. The whole council was on its feet. A growing murmur filled the chamber, a rising pandemonium breaking out on all sides. I don't believe it, Reinhardt gasped. It, it isn't possible. If Cole solved Hedge's problem, that would mean— He broke off, staggered. Faster-than-light drive can now be used for space travel, Sherikov continued, waving the noise down. As Hedge intended— my men have studied the photographs of the control turret. They don't know how or why yet, but we have complete records of the turret. We can duplicate the wiring as soon as the laboratories have been repaired. Comprehension was gradually beginning to settle over the room. Then it'll be possible to build FTL ships, Margaret Duff murmured, dazed. And if we can do that— When I showed him the control turret, Cole understood its purpose. Not my purpose, but the original purpose Hedge had been working toward. Cole realized Icarus was actually an incomplete spaceship, not a bomb at all. He saw what Hedge had seen, an FTL space drive. He set out to make Icarus work. We can go beyond Centaurus, Dixon muttered, his lips twisted. Then the war was trivial. We can leave the Empire completely behind. We can go beyond the galaxy. The whole universe is open to us, Shirikov agreed. Instead of taking over an antiquated empire, we have the entire cosmos to map and explore. God's total creation. Margaret Duff got to her feet and moved slowly toward the great stellar maps that towered above them at the far end of the chamber. She stood for a long time, gazing up at the myriad suns, the legions of systems, awed by what she saw. Do you suppose he realized all this? she asked suddenly, what we can see here on these maps? Thomas Cole is a strange person, Sherikov said, half to himself. Apparently he has a kind of intuition about machines, the way things are supposed to work. An intuition more in his hands than in his head. A, a kind of genius, such as a painter or pianist has. Not a scientist. 
He has no verbal knowledge about things, no semantic references. He deals with the things themselves, directly. I doubt very much if Thomas Cole understood what would come about. He looked into the globe, the control turret. He saw unfinished wiring and relays. He saw a job half done, an incomplete machine. Something to be fixed, Margaret Duff put in. Something to be fixed, like an artist. He saw his work ahead of him. He was interested in only one thing, turning out the best job he could with the skill he possessed. For us, that skill has opened up a whole universe, endless galaxies and systems to explore, worlds without end, unlimited, untouched worlds. Reinhardt got unsteadily to his feet. We better get to work, start organizing construction teams, exploration crews. We'll have to reconvert from war production to ship designing, begin the manufacture of mining and scientific instruments for survey work. That's right, Margaret Duff said. She looked reflectively up at him. But you're not going to have anything to do with it. Reinhardt saw the expression on her face. His hand flew to his gun, and he backed quickly toward the door. Dixon leaped up and joined him. Get back, Reinhardt shouted. Margaret Duff signaled, and a phalanx of government troops closed in around the two men. Grim-faced, efficient soldiers with magnetic grapples ready. Reinhardt's blaster wavered, toward the council members sitting shocked in their seats, and toward Margaret Duff, straight at her blue eyes. Reinhardt's features were distorted with insane fear. Get back! Don't anybody come near me, or she'll be the first to go! Peter Sherikov slid from the table, and with one great stride swept his immense bulk in front of Reinhardt. His huge black-furred fist rose in a smashing arc. Reinhardt sailed against the wall, struck with ringing force, and then slid slowly to the floor. The government troops threw their grapples quickly around him and jerked him to his feet. His body was frozen rigid. Blood dripped from his mouth. He spat bits of tooth. His eyes glazed over. Dixon stood, dazed, mouth open, uncomprehending as the grapples closed around his arms and legs. Reinhardt's gun skidded to the floor as he was yanked toward the door. One of the elderly council members picked the gun up and examined it curiously. He laid it carefully on the table. Fully loaded, he murmured, ready to fire. Reinhardt's battered face was dark with hate. I should have killed all of you, all of you! An ugly sneer twisted across his shredded lips. If I could get my hands loose! You won't, Margaret Duff said. You might as well not even bother to think about it. She signaled to the troops, and they pulled Reinhardt and Dixon roughly out of the room, two dazed figures, snarling and resentful. For a moment the room was silent. Then the council members shuffled nervously in their seats, beginning to breathe again. Sherikov came over and put his big paw on Margaret Duff's shoulder. Are you all right, Margaret? She smiled faintly. I'm fine. Thanks. Sherikov touched her soft hair briefly. Then he broke away and began to pack up his briefcase busily. I'll have to go. I'll get in touch with you later. W where are you going? she asked hesitantly. Can't you stay and— I have to get back to the Urals. Sherikov grinned at her over his bushy black beard as he headed out of the room. Some very important business to attend to. Thomas Cole was sitting up in bed when Sherikov came to the door. Most of his awkward, hunched-over body was sealed in a thin envelope of transparent airproof plastic. Two robot attendants whirred ceaselessly at his side, their leads contacting his pulse, blood pressure, respiration, body temperature. Cole turned a little as the huge pole tossed down his briefcase and seated himself on the window ledge. "'How are you feeling?' Sherikov asked him. "'Better.' You see, we've quite advanced therapy. Your burns should be healed in a few months. How's the war coming? The war is over. Cole's lips moved. Icarus? Icarus went as expected, as you expected. Sherikov leaned toward the bed. Cole, I promised you something. I mean to keep my promise as soon as you're well enough. To return me to my own time? That's right. It's a relatively simple matter, now that Reinhardt has been removed from power. You'll be back home again, back in your own time, your own world. 
we can supply you with some disks of platinum or something of the kind to finance your business. You'll need a new fix-it truck, tools, and clothes. A few thousand dollars ought to do it." Cole was silent. "'I've already contacted Histo Research,' Sherikov continued. "'The time bubble is ready as soon as you are. We're somewhat beholden to you, as you probably realize. You've made it possible for us to actualize our greatest dream. The whole planet is seething with excitement. We're changing our economy over from war to—' "'They don't resent what happened? The dud must have made an awful lot of people feel downright bad.' "'At first, but they got over it, as soon as they understood what was ahead. Too bad you won't be here to see it, Cole, the whole world breaking loose, bursting out into the universe. They want me to have an FTL ship ready by the end of the week. Thousands of applications are already on file, men and women wanting to get in on the initial flight." Cole smiled a little. There won't be any band there, no parade or welcoming committee waiting for them. Maybe not. Maybe the first ship will wind up on some dead world, nothing but sand and dried salt. But everybody wants to go. It's almost like a holiday people running around and shouting and throwing things in the streets. Afraid I must get back to the labs. Lots of reconstruction work being started." Sherikov dug into his bulging briefcase. By the way, one little thing. While you're recovering here, you might like to look at these. He tossed a handful of schematics on the bed. Cole picked them up slowly. What's this? Just a little thing I designed. Sherikov arose and lumbered toward the door. We're realigning our political structure to eliminate any reoccurrence of the Reinhardt affair. This will block any more one-man power grabs. He jabbed a thick finger at the schematics. It'll turn power over to all of us, not to just a limited number one person could dominate, the way Reinhardt dominated the Council. This gimmick makes it possible for citizens to raise and decide issues directly. They won't have to wait for the Council to verbalize a measure. Any citizen can transmit his will with one of these, make his needs register on a central control that automatically responds. When a large enough segment of the population wants a certain thing done, these little gadgets set up an active field that touches all the others. An issue won't have to go through a formal Council. The citizens can express their will long before any bunch of gray-haired old men could get around to it. Sherikov broke off, frowning. Of course, he continued slowly, there is one little detail. What's that? I haven't been able to get a model to function. A few bugs. Such intricate work never was in my line. He paused at the door. Well, I hope I'll see you again before you go. Maybe if you feel well enough later on we could get together for one last talk. Maybe have dinner together sometime, eh? But Thomas Cole wasn't listening. He was bent over the schematics, an intense frown on his weathered face. His long fingers moved restlessly over the schematics, tracing wiring and terminals. His lips moved as he calculated. Sherikov waited a moment. Then he stepped out into the hall and softly closed the door behind him. He whistled merrily as he strode off down the corridor. End of Part three of The Variable Man End of The Variable Man by Philip K. Dick